It's question show time, your questions, my answers. As always, wherever you are on my channel, if a question pops into your brain, just write it down, I'll gather them all up, and I will answer them here. I've got another spe special guest answerer this week, uh, Dylan O'Donnell, astrophotographer extraordinaire. So stick around to the end and get some advice on astrophotography and a haunting vision of the future. All right, let's get into the questions. Inert. Could NASA mass produce a bare bones lander rover to explore dozens of moons and planets in our solar system? They could focus on the core chassis, power source, mobility tech, necessary electronics and shielding, but also allow modular components to be added on for specific environments or mission requirements. Is this a good idea or is every mission environment too unique requiring an expensive one-off design that has to be manufactured? You're really asking the question like, could we mass produce spacecraft and send them across the solar system and use that standard chassis to explore places? Or do we build these one-off, bespoke, custom spacecraft and that's what goes and does the science uh, exploration? And up until this point, the, the requirements of the mission, the science objectives, have required a very specific spacecraft for each task. And when you think about it, right, like the way it works is that the scientists put together a wish list of the scientific questions that they want answered. Then that defines the science experiments that are going to be put on the spacecraft. And those experiments define the chassis, the platform, the power system, the kinds of uh, computer that it's going to require, the, the, you know, if it's going to be solar powered, if it's going to have a nuclear RTG, if it's going to have an ion propulsion system, that kind of stuff. And so, uh, and, and if you went with a more mass produced spacecraft that had some plug and play modules on it, you wouldn't necessarily get the same kind of science outcome. And at the end of the day, that's the thing. You put all this investment, all this time, all this energy to get your spacecraft to its destination. You want to be able to do the best possible science. And so that's why the science experiments are the most important part of this. But I can imagine in the future, there's going to be some time where they build, say, a hundred uh, asteroid probes and they go to a hundred different asteroids and and do a sort of high level scan of all of them and then from there they're able to uh, gain some larger science but I think in general we're gonna see these these custom spacecraft developed for the foreseeable future there have been a couple of examples of a fairly uh, repeat uh, platform like the messengers, sorry, the, uh, the the mariners and the voyagers, but in general, they seem to be focused for the science, build the right instruments, build the the satellite spacecraft that's going to do the job. But they also have a lot of interchangeable parts, stuff that's off the shelf that go into these spacecraft that you've you know that look like they're actually custom. They've got a lot of repeat parts in them, so little best of both worlds. Skeletal Misfit. Mr. Kane, my first ever question. Is it physically possible to siphon the atmosphere from Venus and pump it into massive tank ships made from hollowed out asteroids from mining missions and to essentially bombard the surface of Mars with these autonomous tank ships until the atmosphere is thick enough to not kill a human as quickly? Just curious. Thank you. Thanks for asking your first question. Uh, and here is your first answer. Um, so. I get this question a lot, right? Like, like, yeah, Venus has way too much atmosphere. Mars doesn't have enough. Why don't we take the atmosphere from Venus, send it to Mars, and we'll fix two problems. We'll make Venus better, and we'll make Mars better. But the problem is that the atmosphere on Venus is trapped within the gravity well of Venus, which makes it incredibly expensive and difficult to haul out of that gravity well and then take a tremendous amount of distance farther away from the sun and drop it into the Martian atmosphere. You want to start with stuff that is on Mars already, and that's why the first way to thicken the atmosphere is to just warm the planet up a little bit, let the natural carbon dioxide that's locked up in those ice caps, let that all melt away, let some of the, you know, let the atmosphere thicken a bit more. And then if you want to keep going, you can do things like drop comets, which are already in space. They don't have to come out of a gravity well to then be dropped down onto Mars. They're already out floating in space. They're 
in many cases farther away from the sun, easier to bring a little bit down closer to Mars and smash them into Mars. But the reality is, is that we just don't know that the kind of terraforming to get these kinds of projects done is way beyond anything that we can feasibly do in the next several hundred years. But it's fun to think about. Micro Chandran. Hey Fraser, latest news report says that InSight Probe has detected some passing clouds on Mars. These are clouds made up of what? There's no water on Mars. There's lots of water on Mars. When you look at the ice caps, the polar caps on Mars, which are clear from many photographs of Mars, they are mainly water ice, and then they're covered by a thin layer of carbon dioxide that freezes down over the course of the winter and then sublimates away in the summertime. And then what remains is that water ice. And now it looks like that water ice extends down quite a ways you know, below the surface of the of the, the regolith on top, and there's like a, a layer of water. And so what's happening, right, is that the sunlight is hitting Mars. Some of that water, a tiny little bit, is making its way into the atmosphere, condensing, it's, it's forming clouds, and then the terrible solar radiation is blasting a lot of that water out into space, far away, and lost to Mars forever because it doesn't have that protective magnetosphere. So no, Mars does have water. It's been confirmed many times. It doesn't have oceans, lakes, liquid water, but it still has water that can be put up into the atmosphere and turned into clouds. Sunny Sea. Fraser, what are the possibilities of an advanced civilization living in the Andromeda Galaxy? And given what we know about the Andromeda Galaxy, what is the possibility of Earth-like planets existing in the Andromeda Galaxy? Andromeda is just a large spiral galaxy, just like the Milky Way. And so, uh, you know, the, the observations that have been done of other stars in the Milky Way have found that there seem to be planets orbiting around many of these stars. We haven't found that perfect Earth analog yet, but it really is just a matter of time. Everyone's expecting that we're going to find it. So we're going to find other Earths not necessarily with life on them, but at least a planet that is Earth-sized scale, Earth-sized mass in the habitable zone of its parent star. We should be expecting to find many more of these. And there's no reason to think why we wouldn't also find those in Andromeda, just like we find them in the Milky Way. In fact, any galaxy, when you look at a picture that contains hundreds of thousands of galaxies in it, probably there are Earth-like worlds in every single one of those galaxies. There are probably millions of Earth-like worlds in each one of those galaxies. Is there life there? We don't know. We have not found life anywhere else in the universe so far. We think that it must be out there and yet we see no evidence of it. So it's a gigantic mystery and it's one of the reasons why a lot of modern astronomy is getting done, to try and find evidence of life somewhere out there around another star. Graham W. Do gravitational waves not prove that the universe is infinite? Because if it was not so, we would pick them up a second time. Right, I see what you're saying here, that, that we would see, well, here we are on the Earth, a gravitational waves goes off on one side of us, and then it wraps around the universe, and a little bit of a delay later, we see the gravitational wave from the other side. And if the universe, I mean, it's not just gravitational waves that would provide that evidence, like any kind of light, right? If we looked over to our right and we saw some gigantic galaxy cluster, and then we looked over on our left and we saw the same galaxy cluster, but from the other side, that would tell us that the universe is finite. And this is something that astronomers have done. They have looked in all directions to try and determine if the universe wraps. And so far, from what they can tell, the universe doesn't wrap. Now, that doesn't mean that the universe is infinite. It just means that the universe isn't finite from a size that we can determine. So it could very well be that the universe is finite, but it is, say, uh, a thousand billion light years across, or maybe it's 10,000 billion light years across, a trillion, 10 trillion, 100 trillion, a quadrillion light years across. And that we, you know, because we can only see two objects where the light has left them 13.8 billion light years ago, we just can't see that scale. And maybe in the far, far future, someone will go, hey, wait a minute, the left and the right sides of this universe look very familiar. But for now, we know that the universe is at least bigger than we can tell. And it goes same for light, and it goes for the same for gravitational waves. Richard Hayes. 
Question, what's the minimum amount of gravity that humans can live in without the need to do hours of exercise every day? Half a G? Quarter G? We have no idea. All we know right now is that microgravity, essentially zero gravity on the human body, requires non-stop exercise to account for some of the negative effects of being in, in microgravity. That the astronauts are having to exercise for vast chunks of every day. They are dealing with the muscle mass, the bone density, and various other things. And there are other things that there is no exercise that you can do. Fluid redistribution, your brain swells with fluid, you have problems with your eyesight, and there's no amount of exercise that you can fix these problems. We don't know what is the minimum amount of gravity that the human body requires to just not get worse. And we don't know what is the minimum amount of gravity to just like say have a, have a viable embryo grow to a fetus, be born, raised as a child. We have no idea. Until we have done some experiments with animals in varying levels of gravity, we just won't know. We need some kind of rotating space station with mice on board, and then it rotates, and we try different levels of gravity, and we find out what happens to the mice, and then we do it with monkeys, and then we finally try things out with people, but only adults, and they don't have children. And maybe after decades of this research, we might be able to find out what is the minimum amount of gravity, and then know, can humans live on Mars? Can they live on the moon? Chris Dealney. The bioweapons thing just annoys me so much. I used to respect you, Fraser, but you're just spouting BS. People cannot easily or inexpensively design a bioweapon that could kill everyone on the planet. This is a huge lie, Fraser, and a lie that has a huge fear aspect. Shame on you, bro. So this is a response to probably one of the various ad hoc things I've talked about, existential risks, and I was probably listing off a bunch of potential existential risks that could happen to humanity. Uh, and you know, I'm not the only person that thinks this. There's other people who think that there is the possibility of existential risks to humanity, that there could be nuclear war, asteroid strikes, um, global warming, uh, and then there are artificial intelligence and potentially some kind of uh, bioweapon or genetically modified organism that, get, that gets released. And, this, you know, I'm, I'm not the expert. There are plenty of people who are slightly too sufficiently concerned about the potential for something created by humans to get out and and do a lot of damage. And you know, we don't know how likely these things are, but we do know that over time the ability for small groups of people to cause a bigger and bigger impact on human society is getting easier. So uh, 50 years ago, say, you would require the, the entire economy of a, of a superpower like the United States to build nuclear weapons. And now you've got a smaller group like, say, North Korea or maybe Iran or smaller countries are able to get their hands on, on and build nuclear weapons. And if there weren't the various treaties involved, you could imagine even smaller, more unstable groups getting their hands on, on nuclear weapons. And when I think about the rise of computing, over time, you know, to build a supercomputer used to require the capability of a superpower. And now you can build a supercomputer, you can hire a small team, a research group, can either build their own machine or they can hire, uh, spin up a bunch of Amazon servers and build a supercomputer and then have it disappear again when they're done with it. And eventually we will get to a point where an individual can use a lot of tools to multiply their capability to be able to do this kind of work. Same thing goes with biology. I don't know exactly what's going to happen in the future, but I see it as a possibility that, again, 20 years ago, it required the entire economy of the United States, say, to, to decode the human genome. And then one company also decoded the human genome. And now I can mail order and get custom-made human, uh, custom-made genetic material that I just like program in, like, please send me CATG whatever, that can just be sent to me by mail and I can, with some level of skill and expertise, create organisms that, that have never existed before. And so you can imagine, right, we're taking what used to be 
the tools that were only possible by gigantic organizations and we're putting these into smaller and the hands of smaller and smaller groups. And so it actually feels almost inevitable to me that we're going to enter this age where small groups, potentially of bad actors, are going to have the, the ability to do things that are bad for other human beings. You may disagree with me, you may think it's like fear mongering, but it feels to me like, like there is a potential for existential risks to come from human beings and it's worth thinking about and being prepared for and considering the possibility and not just sticking your head in the sound hand to head in the sound head in the sand and and uh shaming people for expressing an opinion that says maybe these things are kind of possible we should spend some time thinking about it so that's my position feel free to disagree i'm guessing you're not watching my channel anymore anyway william johnson Lagrangian points L1 through L5 are in line with the plane of the Earth, but is there an L6 and L7 above and below the planet? In a 3D universe, one would almost expect L6 and L7 to exist. No, there is only the five. And the reason is because you've got two objects that are interacting with each other gravitationally, and they create a plane between the two of them. So yeah, they could be this way compared to something else or this way, right? But they are lined up side by side and then the plane of where the Lagrange points, these plates, planes, places where things are gravitationally stable only appear in the plane between those two objects. So if you had an object that was above or below this plane of gravity, then it would fall down into an area of stability between these two objects or, or just kind of orbit the area of common gravity. But the point is you wouldn't have stability in the way that you do have with the Lagrange points. And if you tried to add like a third object to create some kind of three body Lagrangian space, then you would probably have a really hard time calculating where the Lagrange points are. So that's why there's only five. Toxis. Why do we keep saying that insert huge astronomical event happened 4.5 billion years ago? Why? Is there a total reference frame that we're counting from? Why not just say we are witnessing an event that happened 4.5 billion light years away ago? I know it's a little bit anal, but at least in my mind, the current way presumes that there's an objective time. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we are sure that that's the case. I mean, we get this kind of question all the time where people are like, when I say, oh, this star just did a thing and then someone says, oh, don't you mean that that star actually did that thing a thousand years ago and we're only just seeing it now? Dummy. And the, the thing that's important to know is that we can only perceive the universe at the speed of causality, the speed of light, right? And we won't know if a thing happened until we can perceive it. Now we can say that, oh yeah, we can go back and figure out when it happened, but then think about, say, the path of light. Some object, some, some event could happen, the light could go towards us, but then maybe it could be distorted by some gravity cluster, move around the gravity cluster, take longer, maybe an extra few thousand years to then straighten out again and reach our eyes. So did it happen when it happened, or did it happen when the light happened to make the journey? Did, you know, different parts of the universe you know, on opposite sides of the universe are about 30,000 years in time apart from each other because of the differing amounts of speed that they have experienced from and thanks to time dilation. So once you start to go down that path, you go crazy. And so the simple way to say is if you can see it, it's happening now according to the rate of causality. And don't spend too much time wondering when it actually happened. Did it happen this way, that way? If you see it, then it happened. If you didn't see it, then it didn't happen yet. And, uh, and we keep it simple. So that's why I will use those terms interchangeably. I will say, we, you know, this star just exploded when actually it exploded millions of years ago, but that's when we're seeing it. And so that's a reference frame that we can say, this is when it's happening. Silviu Stefanu. If there was an intelligent alien species in a galaxy in the Great Void, would they be able to know that their cluster is unusual? How can they? Can you explain? Ooh, Great Voids. <laughs> Again, they, they freak people out. Um, great Voids are just areas in the universe that have a lower density of galaxies than places within galaxy clusters. And so there are absolutely galaxies located in a lot of the big 
cosmic voids that are out there. It's just that there are less of them than there are in the places of higher density. So if you were in one of those voids, it would mean that if you looked up into the night sky, you would still see all essentially the same number of stars that we see here on Earth. You just wouldn't see the galaxies in the same density. So from here on Earth, in the northern hemisphere, you can see the Andromeda galaxy if you know where to look and the skies are dark. You can see uh, M33 if you know where to look and the skies are dark. And in the southern hemisphere, you can see the large and small Magellanic clouds. And of course, we can see the Milky Way as it flies, you know, as it, as it passes above us in the sky. So those are the galaxies that we can see. So if we were in a place that had less galaxies around us, the sky would look exactly the same just if you went out and looked up with your eyeballs, you would see the same number of stars, etc. It's just that only under a telescope survey, you would see the galaxies that you would see would be smaller, they'd be fainter, they'd be farther away. But, and so astronomers in one of these voids would be able to sort of measure the size of the void that they're in, they'd be able to find all the galaxies that are around them and be able to sort of map out all the voids like we have. And just to give you a sense of scale, right, when you have the Hubble Deep Field Survey, it looked out 13.3, 13.5 billion light years away, while a cosmic void is maybe 300 million light years across. So it's like a ball that's a fraction, a tiny fraction of the size, the actual universe in all directions is dozens of times bigger than just one of these cosmic voids. So we can see really far away. But in the beginning, they would, they would see just an occasional galaxy and as they built more powerful telescopes, they would see more and more galaxies around them and start to map out that they lived in this void. Subnet mask. Fraser, I'm super excited about the Tethers Unlimited Spider Fab that you told us about last video, but I went to the website and it hasn't been updated in a while. Assuming the company isn't defunct, can you cultivate additional excitement by explaining to us what kinds of things we could resolve with a telescope that has a 555 diameter mirror? No problem, glad to do it. All right, so if you had a 555 diameter meter, just in terms of raw power, you have a telescope that is 40 to 50,000 times more sensitive than, say, the Hubble Space Telescope. And just to give you a sense of scale, the Louvoir Telescope, which is this incredible, right, 15 to 18 meter telescope that is going to be the true successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, it'll be more like 40 to 50 times more powerful than Hubble. So one SpiderFab launch could launch a telescope that could then turn into 40,000 times more powerful than Hubble. So, yes please. Adichidio. If you're gonna do so much post-processing, what is the point of taking a photo? It's like you're creating art, showing people what the Milky Way would actually look like and not using the original photo as a basic skeleton. So the end result is not how good it actually looks like when you took the photo, the person editing the photo was saying this looks good, then this is how it was time and again, I can understand people doing this for wedding photos, but here, completely disagree. Great question, and I am going to pass this one along to my friend Dylan O'Donnell, who is one of the best astrophotographers that I know. His pictures are stunning. Uh, we featured them many times in a lot of the projects, and he will explain why astrophotographers sort of make the decisions that they do when they take a picture. I understand where you're coming from, Aditya. Often we see these very processed astro photos that might not feel real. In fact, they feel super real. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a worthwhile criticism. In fact, a lot of us ast astrophotographers will actually look at work and we think if it's over-processed, if the saturation is pushed too far, it gives it real unreal quality that a lot of us don't like either. I think the best astrophotographers will try and do things to the photos that actually preserve the truth and integrity of the photo not take away from it. Um, what I mean by that is, for example, star reduction. Uh, when we take an image, the stars are usually quite bloated. This is because the photons are being scattered through the atmosphere and around the chip. So the star actually appears a lot bigger than what it is in real life, where it is a tiny little pinprick of light. 
So what we tend to do is reduce those stars slightly and this gives, gives us more nebula detail to see. This is something that is altering the raw image that we get back from the camera, but in effect it's restoring the truth of the image. The same thing goes for image stacking, averaging, calibration. These are all things that actually improve the integrity and the signal to noise of the, of the image itself. In fact, if you look at Hubble images, raw images that come off the Hubble Space Telescope, they actually look like garbage. What we have to do is process these to get rid of all the artifacts, to get rid of effects that are effects that come from the camera, the readout noise, the bias noise, the defects on the camera chip. And we do all of this processing to actually restore the signal and to improve the signal so that we have a more truthful photo in the end. Now the second half of your question was, uh, what's the point? And to that I have to say, does there need to be a point? Obviously for science, we want the best signal to noise ratio we can so that we can draw out the best possible measurements and results. But in terms of astrophotography, we just want to show what's out there. And we try and do this by making beautiful images. And I don't think that needs to have a point. Besides, everything is meaningless and we're all going to die. Thanks, Dylan. Uh, that was both useful and chilling. So I uh, appreciate the, uh, the answer. You should follow Dylan. We'll put a link in the show notes. We'll put a link uh, here. There'll be a little card. We'll put a card at the end. And you should absolutely follow Dylan's work. He is hilarious. His photos are amazing. And if you have any interest in astrophotography, he's one of the top people that I recommend that you follow on YouTube. All right. Well, that's it. We've reached the end of our question show. As always, in the future, question pops in your brain. Write it down, I gather them up, and I'll answer them here. I'll see you next week.